Good afternoon. Thank you for joining Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SICE, uh, for today's Asian Studies program, The Geopolitical and Geoeconomic Impacts of the Coronavirus on Asia. I hope everyone is doing well. I'm Carla Freeman. I'm a member of the SICE China Studies faculty, and I direct SICE's Foreign Policy Institute. I have the honor of moderating today's program which brings together five distinguished faculty members from SICE to talk about how the coronavirus is playing out in Asia, a region that led by China's extraordinary rise in economic as well as military power has become the center of gravity for global economic growth and a place where tensions between the United States and China are playing out along dangerous fault lines, old and new. We're going to have a masterclass session today from our speakers on how the crisis precipitated by the coronavirus is shaping and will reshape the region's eco economy and security with, of course, global implications. Before we hear from our speakers, uh, let me provide a bit of guidance about the way the program is going to flow. Uh, I'm going to uh, briefly introduce each of our speakers and then I'm going to ask each of them to make uh, five minutes of uh, remarks just to set the stage for our discussion. And then I'll kick off uh, a Q&A session with a general question that I'll ask each of the speakers to address in about two to three minutes. And I'm going to try to be quite disciplined about uh, uh, in holding my colleagues to these time limits so that we have plenty of time for Q&A uh, with the audience. And we'll, we'll get to the Q&A with the audience about halfway through the program. Uh, if I could ask the audience uh, to please use the Zoom Q&A function to ask your questions. And you'll, you'll find that function at the bottom of the video window. There's a Q&A icon kind of toward the bottom right of that window. And if you click it, uh, a, 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 a small uh, screen will, window will pop up and you'll be able to type in a question. And please, uh, if I, I could ask you to identify yourselves uh, by both your name and affiliation, uh, and I'll try to take as many of uh, your questions as I can. And I think we're gonna have a very uh, vibrant discussion. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our speakers today and I'm, I'm gonna do it uh, by uh, uh, in alphabetical order, uh, so we not perhaps the way that you're seeing speakers on your screen. Uh, we have with us today uh, Kent Calder, who's the Vice Dean for Faculty Affairs and Director of the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies at SICE. Uh, Professor Calder is a world-renowned expert on Japan who has recently done uh, some truly path-breaking work on how the region's uh, China-led dynamism is shaping not just East Asia, but uh, the Eurasian continent as a whole. So we're delighted he was able to join us today. Uh, on Southeast Asian security and political change, uh, my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Carl Jackson, CV star, distinguished professor of Southeast Asian studies. Uh, Professor Jackson's career has not only bridged the worlds of academia and policy, but also economic development and security. He served in senior positions in the World Bank, the IFC, NSC, and the Defense Departments. On China's bureaucratic politics and U.S.-China relations, as well as Cambodia, we have Professor Andy Murtha, George and Sadie Hyman, Professor of China Studies and Director of the China Studies Program. Andy's an award-winning political scientist who's done cutting-edge work, not only on China, but on Cambodia as well. On Southeast Asia's economy and regional and global governance, uh, again, my delight to welcome Vikram Nehru, a distinguished prax practitioner in residence uh, in, in the Asia Studies Program. Uh, Vikram joined SICE after a distinguished career at the World Bank, uh, which included serving as lead economist for Indonesia and China, among other senior uh, roles. And last but not least, on um, South Asia and Asian security, uh, Josh White, White, who's an associate professor of the practice of South Asian studies and a fellow in the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies. Uh, before joining SICE, Professor White served in the Defense Department and the NSC, where he worked on the full range of South Asian issues. So we have, uh, we have an extraordinary array of expertise with us today. And uh, I, without further ado, I want to start in the order that I introduced you, which is to say again, alphabetically, and I ask you to set the stage by briefly, in five minutes, getting, sketching a picture of the country or the subregion you work on that is helpful uh, to understanding the critical developments and the trends that are being 
uh, changed by or accelerated by the pandemic as we try to make sense of the geopolitical and ge geoeconomic impacts of the coronavirus on the region. So let me start uh, with you, Kent, if I may. Thanks very much, uh, Carla. I think this really is going to be a very interesting discussion and certainly a, a timely moment uh, with Asia having been uh, first into the COVID-19 crisis and um, having some tentative signs that certain parts of it have weathered that relatively well. Uh, in starting this discussion, you mentioned that it is a discussion of geopolitics and geoeconomics. I think we have to uh, re remember the role that Asia plays uh, and key nations play uh, geographically, uh, both uh, within the region and the world. The key point there, I think, is that uh, Eurasia is the largest continent in the world, and within that, uh, China looms within the inhabited portion extremely large. I, it's surrounded by 14 countries. It's right at the heart of the populated uh, part of the region. Uh, Japan, of course, very large, but it's offshore. India is far away across the Himalayas. Indonesia is more uh, peripheral to the south. All very large, very important. And yet the centrality uh, lies to China. When China is weak, of course, it's easy for others to victimize it. When China is strong, uh, it projects itself across not only the region, but also uh, the continent. Uh, and I think we have to remember that uh, Asia and uh, the con is also linked uh, to Europe in profound ways that make all of the things that are happening uh, something of really global importance. Um, specifically within, um, Eura within Eurasia uh, developments that relating to COVID that seem to me particularly important. First, the early effect on China, the fact that this started there the first two months of the year, a 14% production decline in China, exports falling to 2008 levels. Uh, some of these things compounded, of course, by the frictions across the Pacific. Um, China, in China, of course, I've been on uh, several web and ours across the Pacific uh, the last couple of weeks, as I think several have. I think certainly there will be a significant stimulus coming in response to this. It may differ from uh, some other countries in that, and I think you could say this about some other countries, that it will not only be quantitatively large, although not the $2 trillion that the United States has already provided, or really even in terms of relative uh, share of GDP, not nearly as large, but rather strategically oriented uh, in the Chinese case, for example, to accelerate the move toward 5G, toward digitalization and using digitalization as a way to respond uh, to COVID-19, which Korea, of course, also has done uh, relatively effectively. So China is coming out early, tentatively speaking. Of course, there could be major changes from, uh, from the in initial um, economic uh, difficulties, um, Wuhan, even with Wuhan beginning to open um, a bit. And I think this has broader regional and global implications. China, of course, also in the medical supply side, it uh, produces about uh, almost <clears throat> 40, a half, about 43% of world PPE exports a massive uh, role in um, medical supply. Now, what did that uh, otherwise in the other countries? Of course, Japan is still, I think, more of a, a question mark. Korea has uh, done a very effective job of uh, both um, minimizing the health effects um, and dealing with those through very rapid testing and also keeping its economy uh, relatively open, which I think has broader implications. China, uh, because of its scale and its medical supply capacity, 
Korea because of the its sophistication in testing. Even in our in our governor, the uh, uh, Maryland governor, um, recently just received five hundred thousand <clears throat> kits from Korea, for example. So uh, those two countries, I think, are coming. One in a, a soft authoritarian paradigm, and the other in a more market capitalist paradigm. Uh, to play a more significant uh, role globally as a result of this. Naturally, many uh, would ask, and I was concerned about this in my supercontinent book also, the implications for, uh, for the BRI and for China's ability to project uh, across the continent. Um, certainly, mask diplomacy, China's been giving very substantial aid to Italy, to Spain, to Serbia, uh, to Iran, several of the countries that are uh, most affected uh, by the crisis. And I think in the eastern half of the European Union, particularly from Germany to the east, this is having a broadly positive effects uh, to the west partly because of lower quality uh, testing equipment, so on, it somewhat more of a negative effect. So it's a mixed picture, but I think it does make it difficult for the European Union to move decisively against China or to restrain the economic forces that to my mind, over time are uh, steadily deepening uh, interdependence across the continent. Um, I, within the region, the net effect, I think, on Sino-Japanese relations that I look at a lot is in the short term uh, positive, the crisis consciousness that both countries feel, uh, symbolic steps that Japan took toward China in the early part of the crisis, and then conversely that China has rep, uh, taken the Secretary General of the LDP itself having strong uh, personal ties over time, also uh, across the, uh, with, with Beijing. Um, so I think much of Asia, the part of Asia that I look at is, is coming together more um, to a greater degree than was previously the case. Asia, because of a relatively successful, and I say this definitely, I don't think further to the South, this is nearly true, but if you look at China, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, uh, mostly Singapore, and Korea, in many ways, Japan is a successful story that will enhance um, Asia's role on the global scene. Let's I could stop. go on, but... Yeah, let's stop there and, and uh, pick up on some of those themes uh, after uh, we hear from other colleagues, but that was a wonderful start to this, this program. Thank you very much. Carl, let me ask you to uh, share some thoughts uh, focusing more on Southeast Asia. Uh, let me begin uh, where Kent left off, because I think looking at the data intensely every day, uh, that uh, first of all, there are lower infection rates uh, in Southeast Asia uh, than in either Western Europe or the United States, if the data are to be believed. Uh, there are much lower death rates per capita uh, in Asia uh, than there are in Western Europe uh, or the United States. Now, we do not know whether or not this is just from underreporting, or alternatively, it could be a reality. Uh, but um, that being said, right now, that is for the last 10 days, uh, the number of confirmed cases of coronavirus have been uh, escalating at a very rapid rate. Uh, for instance, uh, Japan is up 138%. Korea is up 12%. Singapore is up 280% in the last 10 days. Indonesia is up 76%. Thailand's up 11%. Malaysia is up 20%. The Philippines are up 40%. Uh, however, I want you to know Leninism works because China is only up 1% and Vietnam has had no deaths whatsoever. And if you believe that, 
I want to sell you a bridge in Brooklyn. Uh, the second thing I would say uh, is that the collapse of the price of oil uh, in the last 24 hours indicates the degree to which world demand is collapsing. Uh, and I do not believe uh, the current policies of stringent lockdown can endure. They must be modified and brought to an end uh, because otherwise the poorer economies on the face of the earth and the lower classes and the lower middle classes are going to be devastated. And while I sit here protected in my house, sheltered, so to speak, from this virus, it is morally indefensible uh, for that to be going on at the disproportionate expense of the people who provide me with my groceries and serve me. On a global basis, uh, the, the same is true. Uh, that is, the rich countries can't afford a near total lockdown, at least for some time, and the poor countries can't afford it at all. Uh, so the policies are going to need to change. I think they will change in the next uh, uh, two weeks. Uh, there will be a modified a modification of the total lockdown policies where they exist. And in some instances, there are interesting natural experiments going on. For instance, the Swedes haven't locked down the economy at all, whereas the Danes and the Norwegians have. Uh, so watch this space. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Andy, let, let's turn to uh, the, 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 the uh, big biggest country in the region, China, for your thoughts. Thanks very much, Carla. And uh, I really appreciate Dean Calder's um, kind of laying out the broader parameters because what I'm going to say, I think, really complements what he's already given us. Um, so uh, last week, uh, I focused more on domestic politics. And I think domestic politics matter. I think they still matter, even in you know, the broader discussion that we're having today. So I'm more than happy to bring that in uh, during the Q&A and, and during follow-up. But what I want to do in my comments here is really just focus on four, four points. Um, as of today, China's uh, uh, number of coronavirus-related deaths is 4,636. Um, and uh, I can go into some of the kind of more, kind of, I can disaggregate those numbers a little bit maybe during the Q&A uh, because um, the, the, the patterns that we see there uh, indicate there's, um, uh, that the numbers uh, are, are, are somewhat uh, um, uh, kind of worthy of further scrutiny. But the the four main points really, the first has to do with um, China's narrative that I spoke about a bit last week, which has to do with kind of this, this reimagining of Chinese leadership as being a global leader in combating the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic uh, and really um, uh, doing, uh, uh, overcoming kind of the initial negative reports as well as what we're seeing on social media within China as demonstrating the leadership, particularly Xi Jinping, as being uh, uh, a, a, an example, a model of, uh, of, of strong, decisive, authoritative uh, uh, combating of, uh, of the coronavirus, uh, it seems to be rapidly losing effectiveness as soon as it crosses China's border. So it has uh, some heft within China, much less so internationally. That's not necessarily surprising. China's leadership always focuses much more attention and energy on its domestic audience rather than an international one, but it is something that I think has uh, some uh, merit to the discussions that we're having now. To um, um, the second point uh, builds on what uh, Kent was saying about uh, BRI, um, and these are I, I think these are some 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 key points that. Uh, that I think need to be uh, uh, underscored. Uh, the last week we had discussed um, the $200 billion in uh, uh, loss of foreign direct investment in the developing world, that is Latin America, Africa, and Asia, over the past two months being an unprecedented uh, uh, economic uh, uh, outcome 
uh, of a crisis. And my fear is that that's going to hit China fairly squarely uh, between the eyes, uh, particularly because of the emphasis that uh, we've seen in the past decade or so on BRI uh, making China one of the key uh, uh, outward oriented FDI providers globally, particularly in the developing world. So Kent was talking about Europe, which is still, uh, which has some positive uh, cases, but uh, uh, the, the jury is still out. But then in the developing world, uh, the situation could be a little bit more uh, uh, problematic. Um, and I worry about the kinds of questions that Beijing will be confronted with, what to do if, the vi if and when the virus uh, uh, extends into uh, Africa, into developing Asia, into Latin America beyond what we've seen today. Uh, is this going to be a, 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 um, a come to Jesus moment where Beijing forgives the loans, restructures the debt? Or are we going to see uh, a possibility of the seizure of certain assets? That seems unlikely, but there is not an easy choice in this calculus. The third choice, uh, the third point that I wanted to make has to do with kind of uh, Beijing channeling Rahm Emanuel's uh, notion of never uh, 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 forgoing taking advantage of a crisis. And of course, I'm talking about Hong Kong right now. While there's been some military activity off of Taiwan recently, uh, the, uh, the, the world's eyes are perhaps more on Hong Kong, where over the weekend, uh, Beijing has come close to jumping the shark with the arrest of key pro-democracy leaders, including uh, media tycoon Jimmy Lai and pro-democracy activists Martin Lee, Albert Ho, and former legislators Clyde Ho and Leung Kwok Hong. Uh, altogether, more than a dozen uh, people have been arrested, and this creates all sorts of uh, concerns over whether or not uh, uh, China is going to be invoking Article 23 of the Basic Law um, in some sort of anti-sedition um, uh, activity uh, or, 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 or uh, preemptive measures uh, that would uh, uh, kind of raise the, 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 the issue of stability in Hong Kong uh, beyond even uh, some of the worst moments uh, of 2019. And then finally, the fourth point has to do with multilateralism and the bilateral uh, uh, leadership uh, between China and the United States. Again, I see this as a fundamentally missed opportunity. We've seen things ratchet up in the past week with uh, President Trump's uh, singling out of the uh, World Health Organization and all the drama and messaging that that uh, 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 leaves in its wake, but what it underscores is again a, uh, a, a missed opportunity for the two kind of, uh, key pow global powers uh, to work together uh, rather than uh, what we're seeing them doing, which is uh, uh, moving forward not only unilaterally, but also in ways that um, uh, undermine uh, uh, each other's ability to uh, manage uh, the crisis insofar as it is. And we are seeing finally some ugliness in the bipartisan closing of ranks uh, behind an anti-China uh, uh, narrative within the United States, which uh, also uh, does not do much to, uh, to, to help uh, uh, the, uh, the larger global uh, attempts at countering the pandemic um, and is making uh, 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 domestic politics in the U.S. Um, uh, uh, even more of, a, of, of a, um, a challenge to a proper response. So let me stop there. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for hitting on some really critical issues that I think are going to play out uh, both in the short term and the longer term. And, and uh, look, I hope we can get back to some of them. Uh, Vikram, now let me turn to you. Uh, for your, your comments. I know you, you might want to take a, a more global perspective on sort of some, how some of these issues in the region are playing out uh, more globally. Well, thank you, Carla. Um, let me just start by stating the, the obvious that this, was, this is not only a global crisis, but it's a crisis that literally came all of a sudden, as many have already alluded to. You know, the first deaths that took place in Asia um, other than for China, all occurred within one month of each of each other. 
from February the 21st to March the 21st. So this is compressed within a month. It's global. It's unlike anything the world has, has ever seen. And the big point that I want to make is that it's come at the point in time where it is exacerbating many of the conditions that already existed in the world economy. There was secular stagnation to begin with, low productivity growth, low investment returns, near deflation conditions, right? And the and, and global growth is going to be trimmed by something like two percentage points a month as the crisis persists, which is a very dramatic decline virtually uh, month by month. And secondly, the world was seeing economic nationalism, uh, which meant that the governments were you know, shutting their economies off from the rest of the world. And this was at a time when the world needed global cooperation. Countries have been imposing export controls on medical supplies and drugs. And perhaps less well known is that there have now been export controls on food and rice in Southeast Asia. So, you know, uh, 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 Myanmar, uh, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, and India have introduced export controls in countries like the Philippines and Indonesia are now scrambling for rice in the international markets. And thirdly, as, as uh, uh, Carl has, has just mentioned, there's been this dramatic collapse in global oil prices which also has consequences, positive ones for China, India, and even Indonesia, but certainly negative ones for Malaysia and, and Vietnam. So the, the result of these global conditions on Asia is simply that, you know, even if Asia were to recover quickly, you know, China is already something like 90% back to its original production capacity, any growth is going to be slowed by what's happening in the rest of the world. This is, uh, uh, you know, a reality and Asia is not for, for many years is not going to be able to grow as quickly as it as it has as it has in the past and more importantly I think there's going to be risk aversion there's going to be precautionary savings and so forth which is also going to dampen growth in the future. I also want to make two other points very quickly the first is that you know global cooperation as I just mentioned has simply uh, uh, not happened but having said that two global institutions have come out firing on all cylinders, and that's the IMF and the World Bank. The IMF has announced a trillion dollars available for financing. A hundred countries have already lined up for that, Many of, some of them from, from Asia. And the World Bank and other multilateral development banks are proposing $240 billion worth of fiscal support. And uh, uh, um, one of the more important outcomes of the G20 meeting was that there would be debt relief for low-income countries. Unfortunately, in Asia, uh, uh, not too many countries would qualify, certainly not in Southeast Asia, uh, um, but perhaps some of the poorest countries in, in, in South Asia may qualify for that. Uh, we'll have to see as the details come through. Uh, the last point that I want to make is on, 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 on inequality. You know, earlier in the world, what we've been seeing is rising inequality within countries and declining inequality between countries. Uh, but I think this is going to be now be reversed. I think what you're going to see now is increasing, declining inequality within countries. This is based on you know, the Great Leveler, the book by Walter Scheidel, who argues that pandemics can actually have an equalizing effect as people push for better health care, push for better public services. Um, but unfortunately, I believe that poor countries are going to be hurt much more from this crisis, as Carl and others have already mentioned. And as a result, we're probably going to see rising inequality in the world uh, between countries as the advanced countries are better prepared uh, to deal with the crisis and to recover more quickly from it. So let me stop there, Carla, and get back to, back to you. Thank you, Vikram. I, I think we can have you ask you to address some of those uh, issues a bit further uh, as we begin the Q&A. And, and Josh, uh, let me ask you to, to uh, tell us about South Asia and perhaps also the broader Indo-Pacific. Sure, thanks, Carla. Um, you know, South Asia and the Indian Ocean more broadly is a, is a very interesting place to look at the wider geopolitical, geopolitical impacts because it's been a, uh, one of the leading domains in which we've seen increased competition over recent years, uh, particularly between uh, India and China, but, uh, but more broadly. And I want to say just a couple of things about that, that competition and then say something about uh, the Afghanistan-Pakistan dynamics as well. You know, in terms of competition, when we think about the Indo-Pacific, this is a place uh, we think about South Asia, where we've seen uh, really the largest, most concentrated Belt and Road investment. Uh, that's in Pakistan. Uh, we've seen 
probably the most uh, salient or at least the most talked about example of the so-called debt trap diplomacy uh, that's in Sri Lanka and, and Hapantota port. Uh, and we've seen the most notable expansion of the, the PLA's activities outside of the Western Pacific. And that's been the, the Navy's um, uh, flying of the Indian Ocean and the, uh, the first overseas port at Djibouti. So I think as, as we look at South Asia, uh, we can ask, you know, how is COVID going to shape the, the wider sort of competitive game that has been unfolding in recent years? Uh, and it's, you know, it's too early for a net assessment, but a few, you know, a few initial thoughts that are worth maybe contributing to this discussion. Uh, one is, is on BRI. And to, to build on what, what Andy said, um, you know, we're, we're going to see a number of, of things begin to, to play out, and some of these are happening already. The first is that uh, many of the debtor countries simply won't be able to pay. Uh, we'll be able to, to pay back the loans. This is already happening with, with Pakistan uh, and others will be coming forward. This puts China in a, a very difficult position to decide whether to forgive loans or restructure debt. Uh, second, I think we can expect that China is just going to have a lot less capital sloshing around for use uh, uh, with BRI for investments um, and, uh, and that there will be political pressures within China to um, uh, maybe to scale back some of those ambitions. Uh, and third, this could create a set of incentives for China to ensure that the BRI projects are actually economically viable and actually fiscally sustainable by the recipient countries and aren't simply political set pieces. You know, many of the projects that we've seen, particularly in, uh, in South Asia, are, uh, are questionable in terms of economic viability. And uh, you know, if I were sitting in Beijing, I would certainly be tightening up the models uh, for the, that kind of, of lending. You know, there are also questions about which sectors are going to be viable. Uh, we're in the midst of a, of a pronounced and, and uh, artificial demand shock, uh, but our energy and infrastructure is still going to be the um, sort of main sectors where, the, where there is, is demand. Um, so, I mean, I think if you sort of take, uh, take a step back and look at, at the broader point, um, you know, China's going to take a, a significant soft power hit in terms of um, its, uh, its reputation and its ability to, uh, to project influence in South Asia. But so will the United States, uh, which has not um, handled COVID in an admirable way, uh, and India and other countries are much more, you know, just likely to emerge from this crisis uh, more inward focused, more self-absorbed, uh, and with less capital that they're willing to invest abroad. Um, you know, another, as another point I'll just mention briefly as we think about the Indian Ocean is whether uh, there are opportunities for China to exploit this uh, this situation opportunistically. Um, and we've seen this uh, perhaps in the Western Pacific, uh, fishing incidents with Vietnamese boats and, and uh, with the Philippines, um, some, uh, some provo provocative maritime activities near Taiwan. Um, and you know, as we look at the Indian Ocean, it's just much less likely that China would uh, use its uh, maritime influence uh, in the Indian Ocean. It's just not well positioned for that in the Indian Ocean. So I think uh, the, the main uh, the main things that we'd be we'd be looking for uh, in South Asia uh, would be sort of the decline in in soft power influence with with BRI. You know, I want to say a word about Afghanistan and Pakistan as well. Uh, we talked about that a little bit uh, in the last web webinar that we did, but uh, things are not going well in Afghanistan. There is uh, the the uh, peace deal that was signed between the United States and the Taliban is deadlocked over the issue of prisoner re releases. Uh, the election from last September still hasn't been resolved, and there were two competing inaugurations by two presidents, so that's still a mess. Uh, there's the potential that COVID-19 could, could really explode in Afghanistan because of the transit with, uh, across the border with, with Iran. And I think what people are, are really concerned about is that this increases the pressure on the United States to draw down its forces regardless of what happens with the peace process. So this makes uh, Trump uh, and maybe his successor even more likely to leave regardless of what's happening. And so I'd say, you know, even if COVID-19 doesn't, doesn't explode in Afghanistan, this exacerbates some of the existing uh, fragilities. And I think it increases the, the risk of state collapse in Afghanistan in a way that could have ripple effects more broadly uh, in Iran and Pakistan and, and certainly, certainly India. Um, uh, final thing I would say is that, you know, on the other side of, of the ledger, in an interesting way, uh, the, the pandemic has also increased Pakistan's dependencies on the international community. Um, it needs international bodies like the Financial Action Task Force to give it a clean bill of health so it can access international lending. Uh, 
and some of its traditional uh, uh, donors, Saudi Arabia, UAE, China, uh, are all really hurting uh, because of the pandemic and uh, um, the shocks in the, the global oil markets. So uh, in some ways, this is, this is driving Pakistan back into the arms of the international community uh, and create some, uh, some dependencies there that, that weren't there even three or four months ago. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, well, uh, these are all wonderful starts to the discussion, and I now invite the audience to start submitting questions uh, through the Q&A uh, function on, on Zoom. But let me just go give you all a chance to expand on some of the, the issues that you, you discussed by, by asking you a, a question about uh, the direction of regional integration and regional cleavages uh, as, as a result of this pandemic. Uh, as you, you've described, the, the uh, number of you, the coronavirus hit a region that on the one hand was, was integrating, uh, driven in large part, uh, importantly, at least by the Belt and Road Initiative, which was promoting connectivity through the region, uh, particularly reaching westward and south uh, from, southward from China. But of course, the BRI was just one of a number of different drivers for, of regional integration, including supply chains, uh, regional trade agreement initiatives like the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, et cetera. At the same time, you have had a region uh, that was being pulled apart by a number of different forces, uh, perhaps uh, the one that concerns uh, us the most in Washington is US-China competition. Uh, it certainly preoccupied uh, the region because of uh, the uh, out in increasing hostility between the US and China uh, threatened conflict in the region in a number of areas. Uh, you have North Korea, which remains a menace. Uh, Sino-Japanese tensions have eased, as Professor Calder described, but they certainly remain in play. And of course, as Josh uh, White just mentioned, places like Afghanistan uh, are are um, that could could become vectors for a, a range of different security challenges. And then you have strategic content, concepts that, like the Indo-Pacific, that are resonating with some countries in the region, but others are very concerned about being uh, pulled into uh, any, a, a, a great power struggle. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge. And at the same time, as a number of you mentioned, uh, societies in the region remain uh, not only divided from each other uh, along uh, political and ideological uh, lines, but, but even within themselves along ethnic and, uh, and socioeconomic lines. So I wondered uh, if each of you, again, will, will go in alphabetical order, uh, might share your thoughts uh, or expand on some of the comments that you've already made on the question of how the pandemic may be impacting forces of integration or division uh, along any of the dimensions you choose to speak to, economic, geopolitical, uh, or even just focusing on, uh, on the, the domestic, uh, uh, domestic impacts uh, in, in, in the countries that you work on most closely. So, so Kent, maybe let me start with you again, if I may. Thank you. Okay, maybe to start with, I must say I found the comments extremely interesting and thinking about what I've been doing and relating some of what's been said to that. The first thing that I see is I think that there, the, the post-COVID world will see some significant change in, in Chinese strategy. And I uh, speak diffidently because, of course, we have two, well, several distinguished uh, China specialists here. Uh, relatively low growth, uh, Professor uh, Nehru pointed out, which I would agree, both globally and probably regionally. And those things, of course, will hit particularly the resource um, resource rich uh, providers to China that have been so important in the past. Um, of course, over the past decade or two, relations with, in, with uh, Africa have been important for China. They've deepened rapidly. Um, I, and of course, this, uh, some parts of South Asia, Sri Lanka, for example, or in Bangladesh, there have been cases. But if you take the combination of declining uh, growth and perhaps uh, stagnant resource prices and bad debts that several people pointed to, and then the unpredictable elements of the pandemic, uh, you know, the optimism of Professor Jackson on some of Southeast Asia notwithstanding, it seems to me 
that China is going to be thinking twice a lot about a lot of its deeper, uh, especially sort of non-strategic um, third world commitments. This might be more for Africa than some of the Asian countries we're talking about, but I think there's going to be, uh, as we move out of this, a deeper um, inter a, a, a interest in and attraction to, and it, I think for the Eastern half of the continent uh, of Europe, also uh, it, uh, it will be um, received and, and, and uh, supported a deepening, a sort of from north-south to um, north-north uh, relations in Chinese technology policy, security policy, possibly diplomacy uh, even as well, especially the ties uh, with Europe. And then probably more of a strategic focus on countries that are, um, you know, China will need to cut back, as again, several people pointed out. Um, but then to, to narrow its focus, and I think the focus will be on the sea lanes um, to the, across from China to, the, to Europe. And of course, to some extent, overland as well. Um, places, I was down in Sri Lanka uh, in December. I was struck at the depth of relationships and developing some of the infrastructure developing there. And politically, of course, China is quite close to the current uh, regime. I'd be interested in how uh, Professor White sees that situation developing. That's one that it seems to me China might want to hold on to and deepen. And um, Egypt and certain places in the Middle East. Uh, of course, Pakistan is strategically important. Some redefinition, but you know, uh, the strategic side of this uh, in the world that's coming out, I think China will be relatively strong. The, uh, another point, um, I think in terms of a strategic allocation of resources, more than landing for raw material projects, things like distribution, controlling distribution channels, controlling ports, continuing with what it did in buying up Piraeus and Trieste and investing in Genoa. Uh, those kind of uh, strategic investments, the prices will be down. People are saying China's got bad debt problems, but China's also got the largest foreign exchange reserves in the world. And the prices are going to be down. And in places that have good long-term prospects, both strategically and economically, I think China's going to be doing some buying, particularly in the distribution structure, people like Costco and, and so on. Um, in terms of uh, the broader important issues that you raised, just very briefly, um, I, I guess I see, as I was saying, uh, probably more uh, um, the one exception to sort of a broader pattern of cooperation within the region could well be Japan-Korea relations. Uh, they uh, closed down quite rapidly uh, in response to one another. Forget progressive governments in Korea have historically had uh, difficult relations uh, with Japan for the last you know, 15 years over the last 20 years. Um, you know, the, I think that is one area where uh, competition and conflict will not uh, disappear. Finally, I would agree with um, everything that Professor Murtha said about um, the unfortunate uh, trend of in uh, U.S. China relations toward an ability, not a, a refusal to uh, inability to cooperate on the healthcare uh, front more extensively, and the uh, populist escalation. And well, both countries are uh, have elements of that uh, that's occurred.
So it's a, a world more within Asia, just very broadly, I think of greater cooperation and sadly across the Pacific, uh, one of greater tension in many ways. Well, thank you, Kent. Uh, Carl, uh, let me turn to you. Uh, there are a lot of themes in both my question and in the comments that your colleagues have made. And I'll let me give you a little more time because you were uh, a model in responding uh, in your comments. You just, you spent, uh, you spent the least amount of time. So let me give you a little more uh, room now to, to uh, share your thoughts. Uh, first of all, there's nothing as multilateral as COVID-19. <laughs> it, it pays attention to no borders. It crosses all borders, but unfortunately the political impact of its crossing those borders uh, has been that the lights have been going out with regard to international integration. Uh, borders are being closed. Uh, and with the prominent exception of the World Bank and the IMF, uh, we do not see much of an increase, if at all, in international cooperation. Uh, uh, my fellow panelists have, have all remarked about the downturn, the further downturn and deterioration uh, in the dialogue between the United States uh, and uh, China. Uh, and uh, they've also remarked on uh, the assertiveness of China in response, uh, at least partially, uh, to the attack upon the Chinese system by COVID-19. Uh, that is, uh, uh, ships sailing uh, close to uh, Taiwan, uh, picking up dissidents uh, in uh, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and activities also in the South China Sea. So if you're looking for a lift in international cooperation, I don't see it coming anytime soon from this virus. In fact, you know, if, even if you look inside Western Europe, people seem at one another's, uh, in one another's faces uh, rather uh, than cooperating uh, with one another. Disease is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and that horseman has arrived and is having an impact on much of what we've tried to build in the last uh, 50 years. Now, uh, my own view is that we're gonna have a fairly deep economic recession across the face of the globe, uh, almost regardless of what we do. Uh, we, have sh we have, in effect, uh, shut down uh, the, the economies of Western Europe, uh, uh, the United States, and Japan. Uh, China had pr uh, previously shut its co economy down, uh, but now it's decided to declare victory and go home. Uh, that is, it's declared that it doesn't have much of any virus anymore, which I seriously doubt. Uh, but it must, it must, if it is to maintain uh, the health of the, and rulership of the Communist Party, it must get the economy up and running. The same forces, I would contend, will drive the governments of the United States, uh, Japan, and Western Europe to end in a matter of weeks or at most a month or a month and a half, uh, the closing down of those economies. Universities will reopen, schools will reopen, uh, and retail will reopen, albeit with certain uh, social distancing and hopefully with more testing. But the current policies cannot, in my opinion, be maintained. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Andy, uh, if I could ask you to respond in two to three minutes to whatever either your colleagues' comments or the question that I threw out on the table. It'll be a challenge for two or three minutes. And I'll do my best, Carla. Thank you. Um, so I, I, there are three points that I, that I said in, uh, that I, I thought about in response to your question. And I think they do respond to some of what um, both uh, Kent and Carl uh, uh, said. Um, 
they're not in response to, but rather, or they are in response to, but rather building on, you know, what, what, what they've said. Um, the first is uh, this, and, and they're broad points, but I think they're really relevant. So in the first case, um, uh, usually uh, when we talk about leadership uh, in a particular country, uh, we, we really think about it as, as only being able to influence kind of the proper kind of rational course of events along the margins. Uh, in the U.S. case presently, though, uh, we are coloring way outside the margins. And the reason why that's important is because China's response, the U.S. response to China and China's response to the U.S. is really what's going to be, whether directly or indirectly, driving a lot of what we're talking about. And so the, uh, the U.S. leadership, I think, is really crucial here, and it is, not, it is something that we are just not seeing. Um, the second point I wanted to make is, while I fundamentally reject the notion that nobody saw this coming, uh, I think that now that it is upon us, uh, I think it is unclear as to what exactly to do. Uh, I think it's really important to understand that we are um, really in a, a, when IR, international relations scholars talk about international anarchy, uh, you know, we're very much experiencing it in a, in, in a very kind of profound way right now. Um, and of course, the problem under anarchy is always trying to figure out in the absence of information what's going to happen and mitigating it under conditions of uncertainty. And again, I don't see much of that being done except, um, it, for example, um, in the, um, the exceptions that, that Kent mentioned. Uh, to Kent's point about um, China kind of weathering this uh, 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 probably uh, 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 better um, than than some of the the um, the, kind of the gloomier predictions uh, uh, would uh, would uh, would argue, I, I I think that that obviously all of this remains to be seen. But given China's um, opportunistic approach to foreign policy in general. This is something that is not new to the current situation, but something that is you know, very much baked into uh, China's pursuit of international, uh, its role in the international uh, 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 community. Um, I, I, I think that that is perfectly consistent with what Kent uh, is, is, is laying out. And then finally, I just want to mention uh, this idea of unknown unknowns. So one of the things that um, Carl indicated in one of his earlier comments, and this goes into the, the, the third part of your question, Carla, but we don't really know what the transmission rate of COVID-19 is in rural areas. And many of the countries that we're talking about have fairly large rural populations, including, I might add, the United States. How the, you know, so, so in, in some sense, what we're talking about now is kind of the sound of one hand clapping. We really don't have the, inf we don't have the information on what is happening now and what has happened. We have even less information on what could happen uh, once this reaches a, 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 a more spread out population, but nonetheless, in some ways, a much more vulnerable population. Um, and so that is something that I think we should be keeping not too far in the, in the rear view mirror, because that may well affect everything that we're talking about and push it in a different, uh, along a different vector. So let me stop there. Thanks, Andy. Well, Vikram, I, I'd hope to actually that you might talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the sort of socioeconomic dimensions of this and in, in the, the uh, divisions that may be emerging or be, being exacerbated by the, by the pandemic. But uh, let, me, let me let you, you know, I hope you'll address that. And, and uh, also just to put it on the table because we will only have about a half an hour for Q&A, uh, there's a lot of interest in how uh, the, uh, in the fact that this pandemic has exposed the vulnerability of supply chains. Alumnus uh, John Ganass, uh, a class of uh, 2016 from SICE, asked, uh, asked if, if a number of you could comment on this, and I, I thought I'd start with you. So I'll fold that into, into, into your time here. Well, thank you, Carla. In fact, I saw the question by John Ganass, and it very nicely fit with the question that you've posed about, about integration. Uh, I mean, there's no question that this crisis is going to lead to a fundamental reevaluation of the long and complex value chains uh, that have been developed over the last several decades. And those value chains have basically emphasized efficiency over resilience because these were, you know, these were not particularly well thought through in the event of tail risks of the kind that we're seeing that we're seeing today. So the question is this: that what, how will these tail risks, uh, 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 these 
sort of sudden black swan events of the kind that we're undergoing right now affect regional value chains? And, and you know, the, the answer is not that there will be a lot of onshoring uh, because that would be going in the opposite direction, you know, putting resilience over efficiency. The question is how will those two be, be balanced? And I think what firms are likely to consider is to locate investments in countries which have two things. The first, that they have strong states that are capable of managing black swan events, events well and engineering a recovery. And I'm not saying here necessarily democratic or authoritarian, but simply strong states that are able to do this because there have been many democratic countries that have been able to deal with this, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, they've all, and, you know, have all managed this pretty well, they're democratic, but there are some authoritarian countries that have done well too. So firms will be looking for strong states and firms will also be looking, I think, for states that will have similar interests and values, if you wish, as the Western democracies. Many of these multinationals are, 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 are from the Western countries and they would fear that if they were to, for example, continue to invest in China, you know, given the rising tensions with China, this could uh, eventually come back and, and bite them. So China is not a strong state that they will necessarily uh, be inclined towards. And the question is, you know, where does that leave us? Which countries uh, have uh, both strong states and the ability to provide a kind of large markets, skilled labor, and cheap labor that China has been able to do in the past? And, and when I look around the world, there aren't very many countries like that. Uh, India and Indonesia, perhaps, uh, would, would be at the top of one's list, uh, though arguably they don't have necessarily very strong states. But the big problem with India and Indonesia is going to be that they are not outward looking. They don't welcome foreign invest investment. They don't have relatively open trade policies. So they, they are not uh, uh, going to be uh, um, uh, inclined towards uh, providing uh, support for the relocation decisions that these multinationals are going to go through. So in the end, I suspect what's going to happen is what's been happening in the past. Uh, relocating firms that have been relocating from China have been going to Vietnam. They've been going to Thailand to some extent, Malaysia. Some have been going to South Korea, others have been going to Mexico, and those countries are going to continue to receive now what I suspect will be a tsunami of uh, a relocation of production locations by, by firms. And unfortunately, I don't believe the large countries of Asia, i.e. other than China, i.e. India and Indonesia will necessarily benefit from this. Let me make one more quick point about integration. Uh, and that is the point that I think uh, uh, Professor Calder made as well as uh, uh, I think uh, Professor Martha. And that is that there has been, there have been huge capital outflows from developing countries and Asian developing countries have not uh, been immune from that. Uh, tens of billions of dollars have left and this is in the form by the way of portfolio capital. This is not foreign direct investment that has flown out, it can't, but it's portfolio capital. And there's been a collapse of asset prices Asset prices, meaning share prices, bond prices, as well as, and I suspect this will happen in, in inevitably, uh, real estate prices, and this will have a big impact on the financial sectors of these countries. But one of the implications of this is that Chinese firms, I'm not here talking about BRI or the Chinese government, but I think Chinese firms, which have substantial, potentially substantial reserves available, uh, um, will be able to pick up many of these assets at bargain basement prices. In fact, there's already some evidence that Chinese firms have been going around shopping uh, uh, in Asia, uh, in India, uh, in Southeast Asia. And the question is how welcoming or concerned should Asian countries be uh, of what could possibly be very sharp increases in Chinese purchases of Asian assets? Um, because uh, on the one hand, such purchases can bring new management, techno new technologies, uh, new uh, uh, um, access to markets. Uh, but on the other, there is the experience that China has used its economic heft to pursue national strategic interests and has used Chinese firms in that process. So there is some concern about whether this will affect the sovereignty, if you wish, 
or the independence of, of Asian countries with increasing Chinese presence as, as, as asset owners. So I just leave that, leave that out there. Uh, I think previous pandemics have significantly changed uh, the structure of international relations in, in regions and in the world. And there's no reason to suspect why this is not going to happen again this time. The China-centric nature of Asia, which had been growing over the last several decades, is probably going to be accelerated as a result of this crisis. Well, thank you, Vikram. Uh, Josh, may, let me go to you. Uh, maybe you could talk about this specifically in the context of South, South uh, Asia. And maybe we've, we've heard a little bit about India, maybe highlight uh, the role of India and how this is affecting India, another major power in the region. Thanks. Uh, you know, whenever we, we talk about South Asian integration, it's, it's usually a, a short and not very, very happy story. Uh, South Asia is not politically integrated. It doesn't have uh, effective cross-cutting institutions. It's not uh, economically integrated. So uh, if anything, this crisis is, is probably likely to reinforce the protectionist and kind of economic nationalist impulses. Um, you know, listening to my colleagues, it, it, it struck me that, you know, one interesting way to, to think about um, the, uh, the effects of of this crisis is to think about the stories that countries are likely to tell themselves, um, yeah, as they uh, as they you know are in the midst of this crisis and come out of it, uh, versus the stories that maybe they should be telling themselves. Um, you know, think about uh, Pakistan. Um, you know, there's some people in Pakistan who are who are taking this crisis as a um, sort of a, a congratulatory pat on the back that they are not um, heavily export oriented. Uh, and therefore, being somewhat more more autarkic, you know, they they were able to to weather the um, the, the earlier global crises and perhaps this one. Uh, the lesson they probably should be telling themselves is that they're woefully behind the curve in terms of diversifying their their exports and finding uh, comparative advantages in, in exports. You know, with respect to India, uh, their the story that they're they're telling themselves. Uh, is that they need to be wary about Chinese investment. Uh, you know, they're, they're probably right about that. Uh, the government of India just uh, just issued a, um, an order that uh, they need to have, uh, there needs to be high level sign off for uh, investment that's coming from neighboring countries. Um, and uh, I'll give you a hint, they're not talking about Bhutan. Uh, there, there are concerns about uh, sort of predatory or opportunistic um, uh, uh, moves by China to snap up um, assets at bargain basement prices. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're, they're probably right to be concerned about that. But, you know, more broadly, I think the worry is that this crisis will, will play into a story that the, um, a narrative that the Indian government has been telling itself that it needs to continue to raise tariffs to protect uh, infant industries, uh, and almost everything is an infant industry. Uh, that it needs to focus on manufacturing uh, indigenously rather than in integrating more deeply with global supply chains, uh, that it needs to focus on, on self-reliance. And I think, you know, in some sectors, that's probably appropriate. But uh, more broadly, I think a lot of us would look at India and, uh, and make the case that that's not the story that it needs to be, to be telling itself. And it needs to find areas where it can uh, build on its comparative advantages, uh, be open to investment instead of, as uh, Professor Nehru said, being, uh, um, being a rather difficult place for, for, for FDI. Uh, so, so I worry that India is going to draw some of the wrong lessons here. Uh, you know, one final thing I, I'd say about India is that uh, this crisis, in a strategic sense, provides some close-at-home opportunities for, for India. It's going to have a number of distressed economies within its neighborhood, uh, particularly among the small countries. Uh, and, you know, India has a long history of articulating good neighbor policies and then not, not really following through on them. Uh, now, it, you know, I'm a little skeptical that it can capitalize on these opportunities. It's going to be distracted. It's, it has uh, limited capital. Uh, but in looking at Sri Lanka and the Maldives and, and Bangladesh, uh, certainly Bhutan uh, and others, India does have some opportunity to play, play good neighbor after this crisis uh, with, with countries that are perhaps newly wary of Chinese investment uh, and are, are looking for uh, some some support after um, after this this wanes. Um, I do think that India will continue to be very cautious in terms of defense spending, uh, in a way that uh, you know this crisis will probably retard its already very slow efforts to uh, uh, to, to bolster its its naval capacity and its kind of uh, wider security presence in the Indian Ocean. Well, thank you, thank you.
I'm going to go to the, the audience's questions now, and I think I'll start with you, Carl, uh, because there are a couple of questions, uh, and, and Vikram, I also invite you to, to respond. There are a couple of questions specifically on Southeast Asia and ASEAN, and the, sort of one of them uh, by someone whose name I think is Chi Xiang uh, Ng, uh, is uh, will Southeast Asian states be forced to choose between China and the United States, and, and, how, and can they avoid this? And a related question, uh, in my mind at least, is uh, Camilla Abin Atar would like to know if you believe that ASEAN uh, will achieve a bigger role in dealing with, uh, the, with regional challenges as a result of this crisis. So uh, Carl, why don't I ask you, and then Vikram, if you, if you have some thoughts you'd like to add uh, in response to those two questions. You are on mute, Carl. <laughs> My answer to those two questions would be no and no. Uh, that is, um, uh, will this uh, force uh, the countries of Southeast Asia into a tighter position in terms of choosing between the United States and China? Uh, no, I think it will lead the countries in Southeast Asia to become more inward looking less concerned with both China uh, and uh, the United States and more concerned with the domestic impact uh, that this uh, uh, horseman of the apocalypse will, will have within each country. I mean, the mayor of Jakarta isn't thinking about what to do about China today. He's thinking, what can I do to stop the spread of this virus through the, the slum areas of Jakarta. This is going to focus people um, inward rather than outward. And that brings me to the second uh, question. Uh, I do not really think uh, that ASEAN as an organization or the ASEAN countries uh, as a group are going to play a, a major role in bringing uh, COVID-19 under control or uh, the, uh, uh, the results of COVID-19 under control. Each of the countries will try to deal with their own uh, economic um, uh, uh, problems. And we can say that's unfortunate. We could all do better if we, if we hung together. Uh, however, I don't see uh, any signs that that is happening. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Vikram, do you want to uh, add to that, uh, to Carl's comments? Well, I completely agree with Carl. Uh, on, on the first point, uh, what he says is very true about the short term. But if you th consider the, the longer term, that is, let's consider a post-COVID world. I know that's uh, somewhat uh, far off in the future, perhaps, uh, difficult to imagine uh, today. But uh, if, we, if we can think of a post-COVID world, <laughs> I think you know what we'll see is a rather a similar reaction on the part of Southeast, Southeast Asian countries and ones that we've seen in the past, which is that as Southeast Asia has increasingly been brought into the economic orbit of China, they have increasingly looked to the United States for their security concerns. So they've tried to balance the two when it comes to security, but there is very little doubt that they have been drawn into the economic orbit of China thanks to growing trade linkages. Now in the future, some of those trade linkages are going to be uh, weakened uh, as uh, firms relocate out of China. Some of these uh, global value chains are uh, taken apart and reconstituted in different ways. Uh, but I, 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 I do believe, therefore, that some of those economic uh, uh, links with China are going to be weakened between Southeast Asia and China. But on the other hand, but at the same time, I quite agree with Carl that I don't believe um, Southeast Asians will be forced to choose between the two. They will continue to balance their interests between those two powers. And on the question of ASEAN, I completely agree with Carl. I, uh, you know, ASEAN is a group of very different countries, very different levels of development, very different concerns, and they're going to have very different economic impacts as a result of the crisis. I cannot see ASEAN coming together with any common agenda, other than I hope that these countries will remain open international trade so that they can recover quickly when the recovery comes. Because if they were to turn inwards, it would add, uh, it, it would be in a sense even worse uh, and, and slow their long-term growth down even further. 
Thanks, and Andy, I, I will come to you in a moment. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to, I would, I'm listening to these comments and remembering that Kent, of course, has written a, a book on uh, Singapore. And Kent, I wondered uh, if you might talk about uh, how Singapore in particular, you know, a, 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 as you've described it, a, a, an efficient, stable entrepot center uh, it will, is, is going to respond. How is it going to deal with China? What are some of the issues uh, that, what role could it play, for example, in, in inspiring um, um, what you've called multinational trust? Thank you, uh, Carla. This, uh, my thoughts there were inspired actually by uh, Professor Nehru. Uh, he said that he did feel that uh, Chinese firms were probably going to be moving in to pick up assets, and he wondered what would be the Asian reaction. And uh, that seems to me a very important point. And my reaction is that perhaps the Chinese will move more indirectly or try to reduce the possible backlash through, through dealing through intermediaries or various kinds of indirect arrangements. And uh, Singapore is in many ways made to order for that sort of thing. It's always had from the days of China's opening and you know, the uh, Deng Xiaoping, Li Kuan Yu connection, very close ties, uh, many of them discreet uh, with China, but also close ties with other parts of the region. It has the um, financial markets, the rule of law, uh, stability, and then, of course, a, a central role in ASEAN as well. So uh, on that, I, I was interested that the head of the National Research Council in Singapore actually now is a, a medical doctor. And apropos of what's happening now, and there has already been the controversy with 3M that has, it makes face masks down there and uh, the White House tried to see those redirected. You know, Singapore as a medical supply center, as an intermediary, uh, this COVID crisis, I think, and but but uh, others, uh, Professor Jackson, Professor Nehru, especially, are more specialized. That I had wanted to ask them, you know, what, how is, where is this all going to leave Singapore? Uh, we please uh, I invite one of you to comment quickly, and then I have to get Andy's two figure finger in. Uh, no, no, okay. Uh, the quick answer to uh, Singapore, Singapore will continue uh, to be the intellectual leader of ASEAN, uh, either formally or informally behind the scenes. Uh, it will continue uh, to be the financial uh, capital. Uh, all of those things uh, will be true, but Singapore also will take an enormous hit because of its dependency upon trade. Will take an enormous hit as it did in 2008, 2009, and also in the crash of, of 97. In contrast, an inward looking economy like Indonesia uh, will have very, uh, a few, it will have fewer trade uh, effects uh, in comparison. But uh, I think, as Andy said at a certain point, I think it was Andy talked about the unknown unknowns in this whole uh, uh, question. And until we begin to have survey research based data on the actual distribution of uh, COVID-19 uh, in the general population rather than in the population of confirmed uh, cases, until we have that, we actually don't know much about the spread. It's unfortunate, but we don't have the data. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'm going to ask a question uh, that one of our audience members posed to Professor White, and then I have a, and I'll move to, I think, what will be a final question uh, that all of you can respond to, but it'll start with Andy. Uh, a question from, I'm not, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name, Itimon. Uh, Professor White, can you clarify why the United States, even if there's a ch change of administration, might expedite its troop withdrawal from Afghanistan because of the virus? Uh, does that not undermine the effort to end the war in Afghanistan uh, by dumping uh, the only leverage the U.S. has in the country? That's a good question. Uh, and you know, the answer is embedded in the second part of the question. Uh, it would absolutely 
be um, uh, an example of the United States throwing away some of the little leverage that it has um, at the end of a, of a long conflict um, in which we you know the balance of power is not on our side. And I'd say there, there are three reasons why uh, COVID could accelerate this, um, uh, the likelihood of an outcome where the U.S. withdraws or uh, pulls back precipitously. The first are the vulnerabilities to the U.S. force. Um, you know, the United States has, uh, U.S. forces are, are uh, less exposed in Afghanistan than they used to be because they're hunkered down in, in a few uh, a few bases. Um, but there are vulnerabilities to, to the virus or to the possibility that the Taliban could um, could exploit the, the virus to try to, to seize an upper hand um, in, in the conflict. So the, the Pentagon is watching this very closely uh, and there are concerns that, that for force protection reasons, they might recall some of the force to, to other facilities um, within the continental United States or in, in the region. You know, second, more broadly, I think uh, there had already been a lot of conversations uh, within the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill about U.S. global force force posture and wanting to redistribute, uh, reallocate some of the forces that have been tied down in Afghanistan for a long time into other theaters, particularly in, in Asia, in ways that are consistent with the national defense strategy. Uh, so I, I think that those conversations were underway. And, and if anything, this crisis, uh, because of the, the fiscal crunch that, that it may um, provide, uh, is, is likely to want uh, the Pentagon to accelerate some of those moves uh, to shift from a counterterrorism focused mission set with a large footprint in the Middle East uh, toward one that's a bit more, more focused on Asia. Uh, and the third factor is simply that uh, there is you know, this huge level of political exhaustion within the United States about the infighting in Kabul. Uh, and we saw when Secretary Pompeo went out there recently uh, after some very frustrating attempts to get the uh, Ghani and Abdullah to, to come to an agreement, he announced the United States was cutting a billion dollars a year in security funding to the Afghan government. So the, um, you know, these, uh, there's, it's not directly related to COVID, but sort of the confluence of all three of these forces working in, in tandem uh, really had the potential to, uh, to accelerate the United States, shifting its, its attentions, um, at, you know, uh, to other parts of the world and simply internally um, over the next few, few months. Uh, and I would imagine that the next administration, whether it's Trump or, or a Democrat, is, is likely to see this in, in similar uh, terms and with similar priorities. Well, thank you, thank you. Uh, I think, let me take a question from a current student, uh, uh, Stephen Chang Wu, who uh, the question is really addressed uh, to Andy, but I think it gets to a bigger, broader topic. Uh, the, he's, he would like it if uh, Professor Murtha would respond to or expand a little bit on, uh, uh, on, on the recent arrests um, in Hong Kong uh, and asks whether or not this is, uh, he put, as he puts it, a signal showing that China uh, is trying to, uh, to get their companies, I'm not sure what he, what he means here, but he, he wants to show its power and, and ability to push back, uh, or is it just China seizing the opportunity to deal with opponents in Hong Kong when the world doesn't have, uh, isn't paying attention, essentially. And so that, that gets to the question of, of how this is going to affect politics in the region. And I think I asked a similar question uh, last week uh, from an audience member, but what does the, what does the virus mean for, uh, for uh, liberal politics or democratization in the region or democracy across the region? So, but Andy, this specific question uh, is, is about China and Hong Kong. Thanks, Carla, and thanks, Stephen. So I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to it in a way that um, uh, uh, kind of directly uh, responds to the question, but then I want to kind of uh, 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 broaden it a little bit, maybe in a, a different direction than you had anticipated, Carla, but uh, one that I think is 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 useful and and thus far you know missing from uh, the discussion simply because we've really been focusing on the on the geo aspects of things. So as far as this particular question is concerned, uh, I really it really feels to me like much more of the latter, which is to say, this is taking uh, advantage of an opportunity. Um, it's something that I think has been, you know, the, the, the kind of the ongoing question of liberalization in Hong Kong has been something that's been an, a thorn in Beijing's side. And rather than kind of taking a step back and letting things uh, be, be calm for a while and then kind of coming back from a different, uh, a different angle, a different direction, 
what we've really seen over the past five, six years is um, kind of a, a doubling down uh, on, 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 on Beijing's attempts to uh, shape things in Hong Kong. So I really, I, I don't see this as kind of this larger kind of uh, globally tactical move, but rather one that's uh, that, that's really focusing on the, on the situation in Hong Kong, which of course has, has, has very broad uh, global implications. But what this does is I, I'm also, in looking at the question or thinking about the question, I'm wondering the, the degree to which uh, this, is, this represents coherent policy from within China. And I don't know the answer to that. I don't think any of us do. Uh, but it does raise the question of Kind of, uh, of disaggregating China a little bit and just thinking about it um, in terms of, kind of what's going on internally in China and how those kinds of trade-offs and decision points might lead to different possible international behavior. And I just wanted to very, very quickly bring us back to the conversation um, about things like chi Chinese firms buying up assets all over Asia, um, uh, which is you know certainly a, 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 a uh, we, we see it going on now, and, and, and we could see it accelerating. Um, but you know, it's also important to look at questions of what kind of firms are we talking about? Uh, what kind of firms are being privileged in China? Um, the, the situation since 2012 has been uh, those associated with state-led development rather than private firms. Um, what does this uh, uh, pandemic mean in terms of that kind of uh, uh, of that calculus. Um, uh, in the short term, it almost certainly means more uh, effort being expended on, on keeping the, um, the, uh, uh, the state-owned state, the state firms uh, 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 purring along, but that, of course, um, it helps shave off uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 um, uh, percent off China's uh, growth rate, even when, you know, even before uh, the, the COVID-19 epidemic, or pandemic, rather. Um, the other question has to do with that of employment um, within China and the degree to which what that is probably the thing that is 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 at the kind of the root of any any calculation that's that's being made up in Beijing, and uh, I think it's one that we should uh, keep in mind here. Last point I want to make, and that is a lot of these investments are not being made from firms at the national level in Beijing. A lot of them are being made subnationally. And the degree to which they are controlled by Beijing is something we, we are under the impression that it is uh, that, that Beijing rules with an iron fist within China. Uh, that might be true uh, with some uh, demographics within China, but it is certainly not true with uh, local governments and the enterprises within their purview. Um, and so that could mean um, that if we're looking for a grand strategy on the part of Beijing, that is, that will, that's certainly there, but it will be, I think, uh, greatly complicated by what happens uh, beneath the national level. Let me stop there. Yeah, so China has, has as you, a number of you mentioned, it's reshaped its narrative uh, and is portraying itself as a strong and capable state. And I guess going to Vikram's earlier reference to the, the, you know, the importance of being a strong state, capable state, what is the pandemic and the response to the pandemic by states across the region doing to the definition of what a strong state is and, and where does democracy fit into that conversation? And I don't know, Carl, if, if this is something you wanna start, start uh, off with and then maybe Vikram and, and Kent, I do wanna hear from you. We only have four minutes. Uh, uh, and I'd love to get Josh's take as well. So we'll try to be brief here and, and wrap up on time. It's not uh, a positive impact on democracy across uh, the region. There will be a tendency uh, to defer um, uh, all authority uh, to central governments uh, to respond to this crisis. And um, uh, this must have a negative impact on uh, dissent and representative government. Uh, Vikram, do you agree with that? Well, uh, far be it for me to disagree with Carl, but uh, let me just uh, add, uh, you know, your point about capable and effective, effective states. I just want to make one very short point, and that is I am surprised and impressed uh, by the capability of the Indian government in implementing the lockdown in India. It is something which has never been seen before, this kind of discipline that's been applied by the administration and the willingness of the people to abide 
by the instructions of, of the government. And the question really is, how much longer can this last? Poor people cannot stay under lockdown for very long. They need to live, they need to get work, they need to eat. And um, there are already some signs that, you know, there could be some uh, rumblings of discontent. And certainly that is the case, by the way, in Indonesia, there is already open discontent uh, uh, that could potentially erupt. So I just want to leave it at that, that the capability of states is going to be tested severely as time goes on. Thank you. Because you mentioned South Asia, let me just go to Josh very quickly for a minute, and then we'll end with our uh, with some comments from from Kent, our our vice dean. So, uh, why don't I start with you, Josh, and then we'll we'll finish up with Kent. I mean, the, the most uh, apart from from India, I think the most interesting place where this is playing out in Pakistan, in South Asia, is in Pakistan, uh, where the federal structure of the state is being uh, is being tested in in new ways since the really the devolution of federal authorities um, that took place about 10 years ago. So this is, this is the first time the states have had to grapple in a very serious way with how to use their authorities in, in education, in health, um, at the provincial level and not just at the central level. Um, and in, in some ways it's, it's revealing some fault lines and some conflict. And in other ways, I think it is, uh, you know, it's making a lot of ordinary Pakistanis realize that uh, their provinces uh, can provide, uh, you know, a really wide range of services and really have quite a bit of authority uh, apart from uh, apart from Islamabad. So it's it's an interesting story to watch this play out and to watch the provinces, in some ways, stretch their legs uh, with some new authorities that they that they now have. Very interesting. And Kent, um, in the final uh, two minute and a half that we have. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that there's two rather sharply etched and, and um, contradictory uh, narratives that come out of this. You ask about the uh, relation, how COVID um, uh, develops a narrative regarding strong states and what sort of state is capable of countries, pulling countries through this. One of them I think clearly uh, is, the, is the Chinese narrative you know, that you lock places down, that the military becomes heavily involved, uh, huge transport, uh, latest transport planes bring huge amounts of supplies into Wuhan and people struggle and despite everything, they're ultimately victorious. That's one. Um, the other narrative, it seems to me, is another country that has been quite successful, South Korea, much more market oriented, never the degree of lockdown uh, that prevailed uh, in the PRC, um, but a, a more open approach, something that relies heavily on digital quarantines and, uh, you know, digital identification. There's a family resemblance uh, in Taiwan as well uh, in the face mask distribution app and the um, you know, they never lock down restaurants, transportation, any of those things. Um, and they also were relatively successful in containing the, uh, the virus. So I think there's two of those narratives. Um, the countries like Japan, like India, uh, the verdict still out, I suppose. And what the broader patterns will be, we don't know. But I, I think certainly there are two uh, narratives coming out of this uh, uh, for success in, in fighting the virus. Well, it's, it's unfortunate, but the, our time is up. And I want to thank you all for a, a very stimulating discussion. And I learned a great deal. And I want to thank our audience for a wonderful set of questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. Uh, and I hope you'll join us again when we have another uh, webinar uh, from the Asia Studies program. And thanks to all of my brilliant colleagues for your comments. Thank you. Thank you to Carla. Thank you. Thank you so much.